Yeah, I think we should start. Yeah, let's do it. Recorded. Yeah, um, good morning, everyone, um, and good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Ivan, one of the fellows in uh, IR fellows in Tanzania, and we are so privileged to have Dr. Georgi. Uh, I don't think I'll pronounce the second name, but I will pronounce it. You're so welcome. Dr. Georgi is going to be speaking to us about patient care in IR. Is one of the experienced people and one of the great educators in IR that that I've been recommended to and we have been recommended to. Some of us have met him and they are really inspired by him. And he's a program director at uh, at Keza Permanente. So, Dr. George, welcome. Uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ivan. Um, appreciate the uh, uh, the welcome to talk at a global symposia. Um, very excited to be able to do this. I mean, if you could mute the other uh, participants. All right, we can move on. Okay, so basically, um, you know, as I kind of trialed into medical school, I always wanted to take care of patients. That was my primary goal. So kind of farthest from my kind of thought process was actually doing diagnostic imaging because I really wanted to have a, a, sick, a primary role in patient care, right? Um, and after graduating, it was, I definitely faced some challenges in being able to do that. And so that was a sort of source of frustration to me. And when as I was learning kind of my way around kind of medical management of the diseases that I wanted to treat, and not just be kind of a plumber, um, these are a couple of my kind of uh, kind of mentors and idols. Dr. McNamara was my attending at UCLA, who was a peripheral vascular interventionalist who really initiated the whole role of acute limb ischemia treatment with thrombolysis and complex tibial reconstruction and peripheral arterial disease decades before it was kind of standardized. So that was very exciting. So um, kind of in the words of kind of Barry Katzen, when I talked to him about how do I do this, he's like, just do it kind of uh, in the similar uh, to Nike. So what are my objectives? I want you to learn the role of, and evidence behind many of the medical therapies um, that are offered for peripheral arterial disease. This could be a two part thing, kind of a little bit about PAD and peripheral arterial disease, but really the management of that disease. So you see a patient in the office, how do you manage that condition? Two is kind of how do you train, okay? Because you guys are just developing your training paradigms. And I think it's exceedingly important that you develop it the right way, you know? Um, hey, uh, Zaim, can you send an invite to Jim Batista uh, and the crew, Elaine Dong and everyone uh, for the Zoom call? Um, so, and, and, and also what we want to do in critical limb scheme is prevent amputation, all right? This is one of my interventional trainees because of kind of the hard kind of rigors of his training. Um, you know, he became in, in about 30, 40 years, uh, a 65 year old uh, who presents to our future clinic with reproducible disabling pain of the left calf when he only walks a block or two, okay? Um, and then after that, he stops the calf pain, that cramping pain that's really disabling and debilitating gets better. He doesn't have pain at rest. He doesn't have night pain or nocturnal pain, um, but it really bothers him, all right? So one of the key things as, an as a physician, in a vascular interventional physician, a uh, vascular interventional radiology physician, you need to do a good job taking a history, talk to the patient. So it's something that when you're in your diagnostic years, you're just looking at imaging and you become a could we doctor, not a should we doctor. So the number one question you should ask is should I do an intervention? And the intervention may be a medical therapy, maybe supported therapy, but should I do something? Not could you. Don't open up the pictures first. Go and look at the patient, talk to the patient. That's very important, all right? If you take that with you from this talk, you've accomplished more than I can uh, ask. In is my consultation with this uh, 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 graduate of interventional Odisla. He is a diabetic now, coronary disease, hypertension, high cholesterol. He's now uh, smoked for the last 20 years. You know, he wasn't smoking as a resident or fellow, but you know, 15 years into practice, he's 20 years of practice, decided to start smoking. Um, the risk factor that he had is he trained at Bisla and he's, uh, he does, does not drink, uh, denies any alcohol use, okay? Um, so he is an intermittent clodicate, right? He has caffeine that's uh, 
uh, develops with uh, walking. He's now the next thing you do is a physical exam, right? So he has um, uh, bilateral femoral pulses. Learn how to do a good popliteal pulse. Feel behind the popliteal fossa, the kind of the lateral aspect patella. Feel that because it'll give you some information that's invaluable. All right, he has a plus one left popliteal pulse. But if you don't even try, you're not going to get good at that that pulse. And a palpitopedal pulse is determine the quality. The more you do, the better you're going to get at it. And that's an important concept, you know. All right. So if um, you know, listen to heart. Sometimes you'll pick up a critical aortic stenosis or moderate aortic stenosis murmur. One of my uh, residents picked it up on a patient who had a normal echo, and I'm like, yeah, there's a murmur rating the carotids and systole, and uh, in fact, she has uh, developed some moderate uh, AS. So we, you know, something to be uh, to, that's important. Okay. Uh, listen to lungs, especially the basis, to see if there's any bibasal crackles. Look for peripheral edema. Check the blood pressure, et cetera. These are all important. Um, and then review system. Do they have fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, shortness of breath, dyspnea and exertion? Uh, do they have angina or chest pain or any atypical pains? Very important, again, to do a thorough history. And the more you talk to patients, the better you're going to be at it. And that's why clinic is critical. Know the medications, right? Statins are life-saving medications. Uh, ACE inhibitors are very important. And ACE and ARBs are very important and impactful. Antiplatelet therapies such as Plavix, uh, he's on a beta blocker and he's on a glipicide. His LDL is elevated to 180, right? Um, so for especially for a PD patient, that's very high, right? With high, where goals of LDL reduction being significant. His sugars are high. The last three months, his glycemic index is over eight, which, you know, our goal is less than seven to reduce uh, microvascular complications like retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, and, and GFR luckily is normal. Um, typically, we won't go straight to this, but you see that you'll usually do non-invasive like ankle brachial indices or exercise ABIs, but those were abnormal, and we know his pulse are abnormal. We has a very classic story, and here, in fact, he has an SFA occlusive disease, uh, distal SFA adductor canal. Okay, so I think this is uh, kind of the approach of this patient. So what do you need to know? And I think for any disease you're going to do, don't think about the procedure. I know trainees get so excited about the procedure, but that is the least important thing. Own the disease, right? If you know the natural history of disease, right, whether it be cancer, oncologic therapy, vascular, pain, um, uh, the, the function of pain, women's health or men's health, whether it be lower urinary tract syndrome or abnormal bleeding or stroke, you need to know the disease and the natural history, okay? And that's the concept of service lines as opposed to procedures. So it's get the procedure out of your thing. The patient's not referred to you for a procedure. Patients prefer to you with a disease. And a procedure may not be the right thing. And maybe a medical therapy, maybe supportive, or maybe the diagnosis is completely wrong. So first of all, blank slate, talk to the patient, figure out what's going on and what does the patient want? What is the right thing to do? What is the natural history? Are you going to positively impact the, the natural history of that disease? Very important, all right? Um, you're going to want to, you're going to get referrals from primary care, maybe from the ER, maybe from patients directly are going to come to you. And by knowing the disease, which is your responsibility as a physician to know the disease, you're going to answer the should we, not the could we. Okay. Which is very important because you want to have that concept of premium, non nocere, do no harm first and foremost, make sure what you do is properly indicated. You are a vascular specialist. So showcase yourself as that. And that means understanding this disease, especially from a vascular medicine standpoint. And referrings and patients want the least invasive uh, approaches to a lot of these things. So be cognizant of that, you know, and that's often supportive therapy or lifestyle modification. And then pharmacologic adjuncts like medications, and then interventional procedures and, and then surgery. So there's a four gamut thing that you have to think about. Now, this disease is exceedingly common. Aging population, diabetics, smokers, underserved, vulnerable population, especially in the U.S., is something that we see in, uh, in internationally as well. So this is something that we have to recognize and do better with. There's a growing number of randomized controlled trials showing the support of endovascular therapies for these patients with better patencies and better end uh, organ results. And again, like I said, it's a very prevalent and rapidly progressive disease. And every VIR physician has the clinical and technical skill set to provide good quality care to our patients. So again, any disease that you do, understand the epidemiology and the risk factors associated. And that, that includes prostate issues, uh, liver issues, kidney issues. Understand the organ. Understand the natural history of that organ's disease. And understand you're, you're, you're a global uh, physician, you're kind of the renaissance physician because you know head-to-toe anatomy and pathology, physiology, pharmacology, microbiology, 
are all also important adjuncts you need to know because if you do, you can link it all together. So if the EF is 20% and you're gonna do a, an aggressive intervention on a patient that is a small kidney mass of one centimeter, probably not the right thing to do. So you have to put the cardio, pulmonary, renal, and liver issues into effect and what the patient wants and what the natural history is of the prostate. So otherwise you will cause harm. So again, important to put the global understanding of the patient when you're doing all this. Um, and so again, really important to put the diagnosis as far beyond the anatomic imaging. It's your story that you get, your exam of the, of the, of the extremity in this situation, the pulses, your story and review system, very important. Looking at labs is exceedingly important. And so don't forget to order the proper labs. If they have a diabetic foot, you're worried about inflammation or infection, not only a white count, but also ESIR, ESR and CRP are important. So don't not look at the labs. Don't not look at these other adjuncts. Continue to look at that. Don't just open up the advanced imaging. Again, always try a conservative approach first. And let me tell you, if you look at the US, the prevalence of this disease, of PAD, in, in the age over 70 or 50 to 70 with diabetes or smoking is very high. It's up to 30%, all right? They may not have symptoms, but they have uh, diminished ankle breakthrough on this is pretty significant. And they may have concurrent disease or they may have isolated PAD. So meaning they have heart disease and peripheral arterial disease or just peripheral arterial disease. But regardless, it's very high. This is interesting. I was kind of looking up some of the natural history data in Tanzania, and it seems like there's a growing epidemic of some of this diabetes. Okay, and I'll show you some of the numbers. So cholesterol is rising since 2010 to 12, just only a couple years. Not sure what the numbers are now. Obesity is rising. Sugars are rising. Blood pressure seems to be under better control. And smoking, surprisingly, where a lot of the world, especially the U.S., is diminishing, it seems to be on the rise there. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from Ivan what the, uh, the status of that is. If you look at the prevalence, it's not trivial, okay? It's up to 9% of uh, diabetes. And it's interesting, it's very region specific. When I looked at Tanzania and break down to different areas of Tanzania, some are very high and some are very low. Um, so again, this is something that we really need a nip in the, in, a nip in the early stages. So you reduce your downstream sequela five, 10, 20 years because some of this is not sustainable. Two things that really cause a high risk of peripheral arterial disease, diabetes and smoking. So those are things we really need to do an aggressive job at the youth level. And this is where you can go to your high schools and middle schools and elementary schools or early uh, and just educate the kids about this to prevent them from starting it. That's the number one step. And educate the families about how important this is. Now let's look at the natural history of peripheral arterial disease. Okay, I think this is important, okay? So if you look, critical limb ischemia, Okay, um, and Zaim has a really good question. What are some of the resources? And I'll give you some of the resources that are available, um, including TAS2 and AHA guidelines, but uh, Zaim, maybe you can throw some of those in there, in the chat box. Critical limb ischemia, of all those claudicans, it's an exceedingly low percentage of patients that will go to an amputation. So even though that leg is hurting them and they have peripheral arterial blockage, they're not likely to lose their leg. It's a bothersome symptom, but they're not gonna lose their leg. But your intervention could potentially cause harm. So remember that. Now they do have a significant risk of heart attacks and strokes. Different than critical ischemia, which is either rest pain or an ulcer or non-healing ulcer or gangrene. Now you're talking quarter uh, amputation rate, a quarter patient will have an amputation, a quarter will be dead. So only half will be alive with both legs in a, in a year. So remember, fundamental different history with claudication or atypical leg pain versus critical ischemia. Very important that you sort that out in your office. Now, these claudicants or atypical leg pain patients or asymptomatic patients are not free in the sense that if you look at their heart disease risk, they have a significant mortality from cardiovascular events, heart attacks and strokes. So remember that. They may not lose their leg, but if you don't aggressively medically manage them, stopping smoking, getting them on statins, ACE inhibitors, potentially antiplatelets, et cetera, they will have a heart attack or stroke. And you can prevent that as a vascular interventional doctor. And it's your role and responsibility to do everything in your, possibility, in your power to do that. The procedures are great, but if you can do this, this is so much more impactful. And if you can go to the youth in your countries and nip the diabetes and nip the smoking now, 
that's even that's tremendous impact from a societal standpoint and that's what i encourage all of you to do and this is a global fight this is not a u.s fight this is not an india fight this is not a this is an africa or europe or fight it's a it's a global fight africa australia everyone should be involved in this okay again critical lymph ischemia is fundamentally different than pain claudication rest pain which is pain at rest so your your pain is, your foot is always hurting you're not walking is fundamentally different than claudication where you have calf pain or thigh or buttock pain when you're walking and then you stop and it gets better. Remember that, okay? Critical limb ischemia, rest pain, and a gangrene, they're going to lose their leg potentially unless you revascularize them. So those are patients you have to do something about. The others, you can do some optimization, all right? And this is a really good classification schemata that I highly encourage people to use, the Rutherford classification. And uh, I see Dr. Lamb is on the line, so he's, uh, he's on the chat box. So he's one of my colleagues, and he's very passionate about that. He's a vascular specialist as well, and he's going to throw some information out there as well. But again, critical limb ischemia, very important to understand, okay? So <clears throat> what prevents mortality? So if the patient can diet and exercise, very important. So we often, I've started using what's called the Juan Perotti protocol for rest pain and claudication, which is uh, egg whites and water hydration. So uh, I would encourage you to look at the Perotti prospective data. And uh, he was the vascular surgeon who developed the endovascular aneurysm here. And he has a kind of a protocol that's initiated. I started kind of using it at my patients as well. So egg whites, not geo, but the whites have a lot of uh, protein in them. And it could potentially reduce some of these rest pain in a very... Um, non-invasive fashion. You want to keep their waist size low, okay? Um, and you want to keep their basal, uh, their body mass index low too, okay? Statins are impactful. Antiplatelets have potential role. ACE inhibitors beyond the blood pressure control have a lot of benefits in diabetic nephropathy, in card congestive heart failure, and in peripheral disease and reducing events, and smoking certainly. But if you look at all things for claudication, again, claudication is that calf, thigh, or buttock pain with exercise, which you lump in with this atypical pain. Exercise is so much better than everything else. Um, it's about 150% improvement in walking distance in six months versus sloth cells, 50% versus pentoxifilin, which is uh, really no better than placebo. So my number one goal is like, it doesn't matter if you've done, kept them, uh, their foot alive or their leg alive and they die. Right, so we need to keep them alive. That's my number one goal. So how do I do that? This is a big study, 21,000 patients, uh, the, called the Heart Protection Study, and they used simvastatin 40 milligrams. And what they showed was a dramatic reduction in the PAD population of vascular events or revascularizations. So carotid or peripheral arterial revascularizations were reduced by, high, uh, by statins. Nowadays, we'll use a high-intensity statin, like a torvastatin 80, rosuvastatin 20. Okay, so we'll use a high intensity statin therapy with the goal LDL reductions as low as less than 70 in the US and the European guidelines is even less than 55. So it's just something to be aware of. Beyond that effect of keeping them alive, you actually improve walking distance. This is a study by Emil Moeller where he looked at six months of a Torva 80 or 20 or 80 or 10 or placebo. And you can see at six months, the Torva statin, the statin had improvement in, in pain-free walking time. So it's just something to think about that you have multiple benefits of these statins, right? Hypertension, this is a big trial for the ACE inhibitors called the HOPE trial in 4,100 patients. In that PAD subset, there was a dramatic reduction in events, okay? So again, if you look at PAD subset in this HOPE trial, a dramatic reduction in vascular events on patients with ACE inhibitors. So many benefits of ACE inhibitors, this is without a reduction in blood pressure. There was no real difference in blood pressure on this population, but they did have a reduction of events, 22%. So remember that. And again, I told you how important it is to really eradicate smoking. So it is our role and responsibility as healthcare physicians who are taking care of people uh, to think globally and to eradicate smoking. This is a preventable disease and modifiable factor that we need to stop, right? So uh, we need to really uh, go to the schools, the middle schools, elementary and high schools, and the and universities say, look, you guys have to stop this, right? We need to get them embracing this concept. And you as a physician, if you tell the patient to stop smoking, if they don't have any advice, there's a one in a thousand chance to stop smoking. If you tell them to stop smoking, it may not seem like a big impact because it's 5%, but it's a 50-fold impact factor. Remember that. So everyone on this call, please tell your patients to stop smoking. Go to the schools and to educate them as physicians 
to stop smoking because that impact factor you may not see immediately, but in 10, 20 years, your country will benefit. There are medications that we'll talk about, such as varenicline, that have and that have clear benefit in reducing um, their their uh, their physiologic dependence on on nicotine. All right, it's a it's a dopamine agonist, and what it does in twelve weeks is a dramatic improvement in patients stopping smoking. Now, there used to be some concern that patients with any psychiatric issues could be impacted. In fact, the FDA had a warning. But then this EAGLE trial on the upper right came out and it showed that it didn't matter even in the kind of the high risk population. So the FDA took off that black box label and it is indicated. So uh, I think this is a very powerful drug. If a patient has a quit date, strongly encourage you considering utilization of this drug because it's very physiologically disability, uh, debilitating to smoke and uh, it's very hard for people to stop. But you still have to roll in responsibility to, to say, do it because you have a 50 fold impact factor. Um, Plavix and aspirin are a couple other antiplatelet agents that are available, and it's important to consider utilizing that, right? So um, there's a lot of controversy in primary prevention. There is a little bit of controversy in secondary prevention, but I would say if you look at the Capri trial, which looked at Plavix versus aspirin, and it's a single trial, there was some a reduction in event rates with Plavix. So um, in the U.S., it's become kind of uh, uh, you know readily available. It used to be that you had patients that had to pay out of pocket, et cetera, but now it's become a approved plan. It's a little easier for us to utilize, but it's a PTY12 inhibitor, and it has some reduction in ischemic events in the PED subset based on the computer trial. So you could look at here. This trial showed that the PED subset, again, it's a very different bed, had some benefits. Now, there's a newer agent called rivaroxaban, which is um, a direct uh, kind of a 10A inhibitor, also has some benefits in, in a polyvascular patients who have stroke, MI, or, or PAD, they may have a reduction in events with a slightly increased bleeding risk on these like low dose anticoagulants like uh, 10A inhibitors. So again, you really need to go back and study the pharmacology. I know you're studying a lot of procedural stuff and imaging stuff, but these kind of pharmacological adjuncts are exceedingly important to understand. Diabetes is, again, is a global epidemic. I showed you what's going on in Tanzania, and it's obviously it's growing in the U.S. and everywhere, uh, including India, you know? Um, and so one of the critical things to think about is how do you reduce this, right? And goal at HbA1c is less than 7%, and this is really not to affect vascular events. It's really to prevent visual loss, blindness. It's to prevent dialysis requirements and nephropathy. And to prevent the neuropathy in the and when they can't when their nerves are damaged it burns initially but then later they have no they have no sensation and when you have no sensation in your feet and you're putting all your weight on your feet and you're walking you're going to get an injury all right you get at, uh, atrophy of the muscles of the plantar of the foot your muscles start to curl up and you get into trouble so just remember this okay I want to keep them alive. I'm going to get blood pressure control. Beta blockers are fine. It's not going to worsen the claudication. ACE inhibitors are impactful. Statins are impactful. Zetamide, based on a previous trial, the four-year trial showed PCS and I inhibitors are all medications that you need to be familiar with. As a vascular doctor, use a, you're using a blood vessel as your highway to treat disease. You know whether it be fibroids, prostates, bleeding. It doesn't matter or PAD, you need to know these medications, all right? Role of antiplatelets and anticoagulants, we talked about that. Plavix may be better than aspirin based on the, the Capri trial. Rivaroxaban uh, based on the Compass and Voyager trial. All things that you need to know, and there's level one evidence to support their utilization, but you have to pick the right patient, okay? Things to just understand. And obviously smoking cessation and potentially the pharmacologic adjuncts would be nicotine replacement therapy, uh, you know, Wellbutrin um, or bupropion or um, uh, varenicline. At least know about these drugs, right? So you can educate the patients and know the trial data for it. And then, like I said, diabetic control to prevent the microvascular complications these patients can have. My second goal is to prevent limb amputation. Again, that critical limb ischemia patient population is fundamentally different, right? These are patients that are going to have a gangrene or non healing ulcer, often diabetic foot ulcer, okay? or they have pain at night and they have rest pain where they have to dangle their foot because they're gravity dependent for flow, okay? You wanna keep these patients functional, right? If they're claudicant, you gotta exercise them, right? The only way they're, you're gonna improve their walking distance the most, uh, uh, the best is with walking. 
And if you look at the Kreveler trial, which is a big National Institute of Health trial that was performed in the US by Tim Murphy, who's a vascular interventional radiology physician from uh, Brown at the time. It even beat, the primary endpoint, it even beat aortic extending. So it's something to really use for your patients because that's what I would want for my family member. That's what I would push. So whenever you're looking at the patient, think of them as one of your family members and what would you do for your family member? Always do that. Use the mom test, you know? If this is my mom, what would I do? Exercise, I write a prescription for my patients. I walk them in the office, see when they're, they're claudicating, what their symptoms are, get them to that seven out of 10 pain, have them stop until it gets three out of 10 and I push it. So that way you have to push it because if you don't generate the pain, you're not pushing yourself. It's just like working out or doing a run or exercising a marathon or whatever. You have to train to build your stamina. No different with this. So you have to be a coach. Your primary role is a coach and guidance counselor. That's what you do as a healthcare physician, as a physician, okay? And these are the Gardner trial, and I talked about the Clover trial. All of these showed a dramatic improvement in walking distance at six months. So more impactful than medicines and potentially more impactful some of the endovascular therapies that we can offer patients. So psilocytosol is a medication that has a lot of uh, effects, including antiplatelet. It may reduce incident restenosis based on some of the Japanese randomized trial data um, and is a vasodilatory effects as well. Now, the benefit of this medication is it improves walking distance by 50%. But it, again, a lot of these medicines or exercise takes six months. You have to be patient. You have to continue to bring the patient back and patient has to be patient too, no pun intended. So these are important things to think about. Now, again, exercise, look at this, dramatically better than anything else. And then this pentoxyphylline is no better than uh, placebo, really. So what's my plan for this gentleman? This uh, former uh, poor Vista graduate, uh, he's, you know, he's 30, 40 years down the road. He has PAD, left leg claudication. Um, unfortunately, has a high mortality from a cardiovascular, supervascular event. Um, but he has, luckily has no signs of CHF, so it could consider psilocytosis all for him. Um, sometimes I'll get an echocardiogram or do my own baseline echo in the office. Um, his likelihood of losing a leg because he's claudicating is exceedingly low. Uh, and I definitely educate him about that. I'm going to reduce his, I want to, you know, I want to keep him alive. So I'm going to uh, keep him on a low intense, keep his LDL less than 70, maybe even lower uh, with a statin. If not, a cetamide or um, uh, 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 PCSK9 inhibitor if need be. I'm going to get his blood pressure under tight control based on the sprint trial. SPRINT trial, um, smoking uh, cessation, um, Eagle trial uh, supports that for varenicline. Uh, potentially, I'll put him on an anti single antiplatelet Plavix. And if he's really got multiple beds, then I may consider rivaroxaban. And I want his sugars less than 7%, A1C. I want to improve his walking distance. Um, I'll, like I said, there's no evidence to CHF, his echo is okay, there's no JVD, no uh, basal crackles, um, no peripheral edema. I'm going to start him on that. Um, he's uh, denies, denies shorts of breath. I'm going to exercise him pretty rigorously and I'm going to follow him in probably sooner than two months, probably one month, two to four weeks to see how he's doing. I'm going to have him log his numbers, log his diet, log how far he's walking. These are all important things and see if he's following my prescription. I'm going to get his family engaged as well. So what is this? This is the question that maybe you wanted me to do. So what is the kind of the best medical management for this patient? Salosasol, so smoke cessation, exercise program, statin therapy, or all of the above. So it's all of the above, right? So salosasol so has a benefit, improves walking is 50%. Smoking, it's invariably important for us to tell patients to stop smoking or even put them on these pharmacologicals because not only will reduce the, the PAD and improve that, and the vascular disease prevents strokes and heart attacks, prevents lung uh, worsening of emphysema, it prevents cancers. There's so much downstream benefit for this. Exercise is invaluable for this patient population and statin certainly are a thing. So that's kind of my kind of initial talk about PAD, all right? So this is kind of what um, uh, Fabian wanted, the kind of the Q&A. So this is kind of my Q&A process for this. What I want to talk to you about, and this is something that we're really focusing on, is something I probably presented at the New Jersey Interventional Symposium, is how do we change training to reflect what you need to know as a modern-day vascular interventional clinician physician, right? So our roots are kind of from radiology, which is a very kind of diagnosis heavy specialty, really focused on anatomy 
and pathology, but really not focused on physiology, pharmacology, microbiology, natural history, epidemiology. It doesn't focus on those things. How do we change that paradigm so that you become should we doctors, not could we doctors? The last thing we want is plumbers who are going to do a procedure that may have deleterious impact on the patient when there's a less invasive approach, whether it be a supportive therapy or exercise or something else that can have greater impact on the patient's outcome. All right. So let's talk about that. So let me talk about a little bit about kind of my approach. So um, I went to UCLA, again, I'm honored to train with Tom McNamara, who uh, admitted his own patients, including lytic patients to his service, right? So I learned from him how to be kind of a clinician physician. Um, I, you know, he did his own wound care. He saw 30 patients a week in his office um, that were his patients. He marketed aggressively, he competed successfully, and he was just a downright good doctor who cared greatly about his patients and his outcomes. And that was really what I was missing from my kind of uh, pure diagnostic years or even my kind of more uh, could we not should we years, you know? And so this is really what I was seeking. Um, I'm blessed to have been able to train under uh, him and uh, um, kind of learn from that. What I did was post fellowship, I really wanted a job that looked for, um, you know, for academic, you know, uh, looked at academic private practice. I really wanted to have a clinic. And unfortunately, a lot of programs, they, they really want you to read the films. Um, and in between cases, there were orders for invasive procedures, right? So you ordered invasive surgeries, which I was like, it's just uh, kind of, uh, you know, to me, did was nonsensical. You don't order a bypass or you don't order a gallbladder removal. How do you order invasive interventional procedures um, when you don't do those surgeries? So I, I felt that was a problem. Um, and I asked for clinic time, you know, not even if space or time. I know that it takes money to have a clinic and infrastructure, but I just asked for time. And majority of places did, denied me. You know, I was like, in shock and awe about that, but I'm like, mm, I don't think I can, I don't think I, it's ethical for me to practice in any other way since I've seen the light, you know? Um, so no clinic, no formal consult, no admissions, even where I started at our facility. I was really, unfortunately, a technician told what to do. Really, they, I would ask for my patient and frankly, they didn't care. So I had to do a SWOT analysis. What were my strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? All right, not SWAT, but SWOT. So this is an important concept and construct that you need to think about um, uh, when you're planning. What you need to be honest with yourself of what your weaknesses are, all right, and what are your opportunities to improve those weaknesses. So if you look at these four things, we're great at imaging, but many other specialties are great at imaging. If you like cardiology, they're very good at cardiovascular imaging and echocardiography and coronary angiography. If you have vascular surgeons, they're really good at CT and MRA and vascular ultrasound. If you look at OB guidance, they're very good at OB ultrasound. So it's not like imaging is in my only thing. I mean, th and there's the least amount of variance in that, I would argue, amongst all trainees in the, in, uh, globally. Okay. If you, you know, but what about technique? Now, because of the scope and breadth of intervention, it's expanding to so much that we can do. They're starting to become some uh, variability in technical capacity of the graduates, you know? So it's something that we have to be very careful of because there's so much to do and so much to learn head to toe from a technique standpoint. So we do have to uh, be cognizant of that. But still, the bell curve is not that skewed, all right? It's still fairly tight. Clinically, we have a lot of work to do, all right? Uh, locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. That's where I think we need to do, we have the most bang for the buck and it's easiest to acquire because you all went to medical school. You did clinical medicine, you rotated and trained. The, the diagnostic years can be uh, where, where there's lack of kind of continuity clinic can be dangerous and something we can, we need to do better with. And, you know, dealing with the practice development, how do you build a clinic when there is none? How do you set up these things? And, and it looks like Ivan, you're dealing with a lot over in, in Tanzania and building a training program out of scratch and, and got a lot of great deal of support from uh, um, a lot of your colleagues in, at Emory and Yale and other centers. Um, and Fabian's really been a champion of this and advocate of this, which is awesome. And we want to continue to help you in, in supporting you in your development as a clinical interventionist in, 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 uh, in Africa and abroad. And then practice, you know, kind of navigating practice development of all these things is something that in politics is something that we want to help you with as well. So what did I do? How did I kind of get there, right? And I recognize that my training and diagnostic years were really 
unfortunately just inadequate as far as clinical training. And a one year uh, stint was not enough. It was a taste of what I wanted, but it didn't get me to the promised land. So I went to national meetings, international or national and international meetings, primarily I set International Society of Endovascular Therapy, Society of Vascular Surgery, Viva, et cetera, to really get my clinical technical knowledge base up. I went to all the clinical lectures that the Society of International Radiology had and all the practice development talks. That was my focus, not on techniques, but on that. I read the vascular medicine, vascular surgery textbooks, and I think Saim had a question. These are some of the guidelines that I read, and I encourage you to um, read these, and maybe Zaim or someone can put some of these uh, kind of um, sites on the uh, chat so they can kind of uh, pull it up. These are some of the good, some of the initial textbooks that I, I read um, that gave me a good foundation in vascular disease. Uh, this is Tom Rook's book on uh, vascular medicine and endovascular, really to learn the vascular medicine side of things. I read the Krieger textbook of vascular medicine. This is the American Heart Association uh, guidelines on blood pressure. This, you read the trials. I read the kind of lipids and blood pressure, et cetera. So it gives you some background information, very important. Learn the level and evidence. So I had an interest in aortic disease. So I really wanted to know the data so I could guide patients with good quality evidence. So the mass trial for screening, EVAR1 over a dream for endovascular versus open, um, EVAR2 for observation, sick patients, open versus observation trials, so on and so forth. So learning the data was really important. So what did I do in my beginning years and how did I get, how did we get to here? My procedures, unfortunately, mostly kind of minor procedures. It, and I was mostly doing a lot of diagnostics, probably, you know, or well, about 40% diagnostic, 60%, but mostly kind of parasitosis and pieces and gastrostomy tubes, and biopsies. Didn't really have a clinic, but what I did is I took them to this like little like film developing room um, and I started seeing patients there. I walked them over to urgent care to do an exam. I walked them to the lab. So I did, it was very interesting. And the other thing you have to do as a vascular interventional physician that uses the blood vessels as your highway to do uh, surgery throughout the body, um, and a new specialty really in the US that only was formally recognized in 2012, you have to educate patients and the public. Because when they hear radiology, they just think you're a picture taker. But it, when you think about the diseases, you have to educate the patients and the public and your referrings about what diseases can be managed this way. It's our responsibility to, because uh, if I have a family member behind my cognitive dissonance, I want to at least have them given that opportunity. All right. So I gave, developed and gave a large number of talks on liver cancer, peripheral disease, women's health, fibroids to different uh, chronic mesenteric ischemia, the GI, et cetera. So different people, so they could be educated about this. We would meet with new physicians, primary care, uh, hospitalists, get my business card, cell phone number. So again, to be available to them for any reasons, whether it be biopsy, drain, whatever it may be, hey, I'm here for you, you know? I'm here to take care of patients. Um, and that's what my primary goal was, you know, um, I didn't want to sit in front of a stack of films and read them and not really know what the end outcome was for that patient. I really wanted to get to develop. I really enjoyed my patient interaction in my clinic. Um, as clinic got busier, I had to start scheduling clinic patients in on procedure days, which got stressful. Um, and so patients were getting upset. I'd be in a three hour case or four hour case. They'd be waiting. And I was getting stressed out trying to get a case done. So, um, Finally, we got to hire a new doctor and another new doctor. I had a half a day, a week of clinic I'll eventually. Then now I've, you know, now we were able to get from three doctors to now eight doctors, um, you know. So it grew granularly and it enabled me to see patients the right way, it enabled me to follow patients the right way. You know, ultimately that's, you know, I was feeling a lot of angst and guilt and like, hey, abandoning, abandoning patients because I didn't feel like they were getting proper care. Now I feel even if I have to work extra hours, weekends, free, whatever, I don't care, but I don't want to have this, the kind of that guilt that I'm not doing the right thing, you know? And so um, ultimately that's what drove me to do this, right? It's like, I couldn't sleep at night thinking that I was providing poor care and that I, I wasn't following the patients and I didn't want someone to have a negative outcome because I didn't do the right thing. As clinic grew, referrals continued to increase. And, uh, you know, I'd see 10 to 14 patients a half day. Now I have about a day and a half, sometimes two days of clinic a week, and I operate about two and a half days a week. So it gives you an idea of kind of how from a half day every other week to two, uh, a day and a half of, uh, of kind of about 20, 30 patients a week uh, that I'm seeing, mostly follow-ups. Um, again, if you look kind of at the paradigm, you know, um, saw patients kind of round and discharge. My days were getting longer and longer. I was reading films. 
finally got a dedicated clinic and medical assistance and nurse case manager and able to get partners who kind of believed in this, um, like Dr. Lamb, um, et cetera. And we were able to kind of grow this as, and uh, now I'm a hundred percent IR. So what are the kind of the key things? You have to own the disease, all right? History, exam, uh, pharmacology, laboratory, review systems. Don't forget to do that. Use your stethoscope, listen to the heart and lungs, the abdomen, palpate the pulses. Perseverance, uh, you know, I was frustrated by the lack of my own clinical aptitude. I always, you know, left my practice. It was taken, felt too long to develop, but, you know, I stuck there and it's, you know, it's working out, you know, like I've gotten a lot better. I'm able to pr provide the care that I feel I can be proud, you know, feel comfortable with, you know. Um, you need to get, you know, referrals in from the patients and primary care and urgent care and podiatrists and extenders and anywhere. Um, special referrals may not be sustainable. And the three A's, you have to be available for your patients and your friends, and you have to be affable. Even if you're tired, you have to be like, how would I want to be on the phone if I'm calling the console, right? Because when they're calling you, it's an, they're asking for your help. That's the way it should be, you know? So don't get, you know, even if you're tired, don't get annoyed. And it's very easy. And I have to, you know, sometimes do better myself, but it's something that we have to always think about. Like, what if I was the other side? Okay. And number two, let's talk about this in the last few minutes. Learn from history and not repeat errors or past. So this is Gary Becker. He was a, he was a former Miami Cardiovascular Institute attending. He was at Indiana University. And then he went to the American, College, American Board of Radiology as executive director. And in 1999, he presented this lecture in Interventional Radiology 2000 and Beyond, Back from the Brink. And a lot of it was about daughter as a visionary. And I encourage you to read everything you can about Charles Theodore Daughter. Uh, he's really a unique individual, but he was a, a, a climber. Um, he obviously invented a lot of what we did. He, was just, uh, he did some amazing stuff. He hired this guy, Melvin Judkins, um, to become his fellow. Judkins uh, was, um, and Daughter were, were Albert Starr, was of the Star Edwards uh, heart valve, right? So since, since they were doing valvular surgery, stars like uh, the star was like, hey, I need someone to learn cornea angiography. So Melvin Judkins, who was a radiologist at the time, went over to Cleveland Clinic to work with Mason Stones, who was a pediatric cardiologist, to do a brachial cut down and do cornea angiography. Well, Judkins developed these catheters called the Judkins right, Judkins left, and the, um, the pig, angle pigtail for cornea and LV angiography that are still used to stay throughout the world. If you're any cath lab, you'll see these catheters developed by a vascular venture radiology physician. Now, this spirit of kind of collaboration, innovation occurred. Here's daughter, uh, more broad than in the US. So I'm hoping this kind of clinical revolution really takes off in Africa and elsewhere because this global thing is very important. So I'm very excited to see that I'm able to talk to my kind of counterparts in Tanzania and elsewhere in the world and educate you about this, just like, you know, daughter and Zietler and Grunzik, who developed the cornea angioplasty, were able to share ideas, and maybe one or two of you gets inspired and changes the world of medicine forever. That is the goal, right? And I think if we can collaborate and innovate together, right? This is a German radiologist, because in the US, people didn't embrace daughter's techniques. Europe did. And Grunzik was able to train with Zietler and learn from these all these three kind of powerhouses of changing endovascular world and endovascular arena. And hopefully we can do the same. This is a Andreas Adam who gave the 22nd uh, daughter lecture. And he talked about, hey, you know, where's interventional going? Vinny, Vinny vanished. And so what he was saying is like, hey, we, we can do research skills and training, but we need to have kind of a patient to care component. And what he also complained about or concerned about is we're spending too much time learning phegnomastic fibrodysplasia, enchondromas, giant cell tumors, non aspirant fibromas. You know, you know, this and that, you know, these Mazabras, Jaffe, Campanacci, all these things, when we're not spending enough time as interventional physicians learning about diabetes or the technology or techniques. So how do we change our training to reflect that? Those gap years of radiology, you should be integrating this training throughout from med school on. So if you look at, um, this is an Eamon Hobbs slide. We're great at innovating as interventional specialists. We generate an idea, develop, and then kind of a loss procedure migrate. So something that you really are passionate about doing, why are you not continue to do it? Because you don't have kind of understanding of natural disease. So, you know, some people would argue that, hey, maybe we're developing the procedures, but we're not keeping on to them. And, uh, you know, but really, I think 
Universal radiology is like surgery, only it's magic, right? I think that's what's exciting about this field. And that's where we've been able to recruit a lot of students and especially because it is very exciting. But how do we change our training paradigm to reflect our modern day interventionalists and what it means to be a clinician, to take care of patients and really ultimately my primary role is being a guidance counselor, longitudinally uh, following patients and comprehensive management. You have to have a paradigm shift. Instead of saying UAE, management of abnormal uterine bleeding or dysfunctional uterine bleeding is important. Knowing the natural history of that, the epidemiology and the prognosis, the risk factors, what are the pharmacologic adjuncts, whether it be kind of, uh, kind of depo provera or provera or whatever it may be, what's the physiology and following these patients to see if they're uh, responding to your uh, pharmacologic adjuncts or interventional adjuncts. So as you're developing your training pathways in your various countries, all right, how do we do that? I think that the VR clinic exposure is really important for trainees. So once you identify someone out of medical school, and I encourage you to identify medical students who are interested in interventional therapies, as opposed to going through radiology, should come out of medical school as a separate pathway, right? Because you want to identify people who are primarily passionate about and are unwilling to give up patient care responsibilities. That should be their primary focus set up a VR clinic for them where they can see their patients, learn the questions that the patients are gonna ask and counsel them. So Zayim, you can count, you know, you've been doing clinic for a while. You can comment in the chat what your experience, exposure and experience has been uh, with your own clinic and Karthik, if you're available as well, you can comment in your experience as a more senior interventional resident. Practice development, resident responsibility for providing education to referrings is very important too, to get the word out so that patients will ultimately benefit from this interventional limbo therapy. What are the treatment, the kind of training paradigms? There's historical kind of the diagnostic and the IR procedural years, kind of clinical, which I've really embraced, which is a UVA model. But U Michigan, Rush and Kaiser, a few programs have integrated that. And then the current integrated which the real benefit of our current training paradigm in the U.S. is that we're recruiting uh, students who really care about patient care as their primary focus, right? I think that's very important imperative. So what are some of the frustrations that we're hearing from graduates or people coming into the, this new paradigm? There's not enough clinical care their first three years, right? There's mostly diagnostic without a clinic, without clinical rotations, without a lot of IR. Most of the clinical programs right now that the IR programs only do three months and three years. That's just inadequate. So what is true integration? And I, you know, I embrace this model not only from talking now at Matsumoto UVA at a, at a AUR meeting, but um, also seeing the, the, the downstream of, uh, of end product of the program, like Dr. Swe Warren Swee and Dr. Kaja, Minaj Kaja, um, who are outstanding clinicians and care about the patients and comprehensive management. I'm like, okay, so this thing works. That's what I recognize, right? So it's not something that kind of came out of my own. It's just from talking to lots of people and trainees. And what did they do? They integrated ICU, cardiology consults, vascular surgery during those early years of mostly diagnostic. And what does it do? It helps you take care of sick patients, hypotensive patients, bradycardic patients, SBT, AFib, um, all these things were really very, very important to learn so that you can take care of patients, right? Think about it. A lot of your patients have bad hearts, bad lungs, bad kidneys, bad livers. They're often too ill for surgery. You're not going to have anesthesia there. You're going to have to manage a lot of this. So you better be comfortable managing these conditions. And that's why the ICU is imperative. So what do we recommend? Okay. Fourth year of medical school, which is, a, you know, oftentimes is more electives, really encourage a rigorous multi three or four, three IR blocks and a vascular surgery block, a cardiology block, et cetera. So we encourage a lot of clinical rotations and ICU training that final year of medical school. We recommend surgery is kind of the primary kind of way to get your foundation down because there are a lot of surgical concepts that are needed to be embraced by the interventional surgeon. And then back-to-back -back months of interventional to the first three years of inter, uh, residency. Clinic and ICU are very paramount to getting good training. So I highly encourage that, those two concepts. So our residents get a half a day of clinic a week. I know uh, Zayim kind of commented on if uh, uh, anyone else um, from our, our uh, Kaiser can comment their training, our car ticket, et cetera. Um, and so we encourage a lot of critical care, uh, IC, CCU, MICU, et cetera, um, to get very comfortable dealing with ill patients with cardiopulmonary uh, hepatic renal disease. 
uh, pulmonary critical care IR intensivist. This is uh, Dr. Zhang. We do a morning web, a workshop, including non-invasive pressure ventilation, whether it be uh, you know nasal cannula, high flow oxygen, non-rebreather, face mask, um, you know BiPAP. Uh, all those things we go through and learn how to kind of optimize that in our suites and when we're using sedation. It's really important. Okay. Um, set management of sepsis with the sepsis guidelines and the trials, rivers and promise trial, et cetera, and really knowing fluid resuscitation and the role of lactate and the role of uh, pressors. And we have uh, no norepinephrine in our lab that we can initiate for bleeding and sepsis. Master infusion protocols for bleeding, role of pressors, um, again, ventilators and management of ventilators, uh, you know, the basics of it. So you know how sick a patient is, what their PF ratios or uh, PAO2 to FIO2 ratios are, what their ABG is showing. Um, when you go to see an ICU patient, how ill are they when you bring them down? Is that's the time to do an elective G2 versus waiting until they're off pressors, et cetera. So again, you have to first stratify these patients yourself and make a decision of what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Um, this is the resident RFS. I encourage you all to go to here. There's a lot of good resources on here, including block schedules and, uh, for medical students, professional development, a lot of like YouTube videos, et cetera. Um, a lot of information there that I encourage you uh, to go look at at rfs.sirweb.org. Um, I know Dr. Bot's on the line. He uh, did a lot to build that website. Dr. Lamb did a lot in the initial years as a kind of head of the RFS um, years ago. So, um, you know, we put a lot of time and effort into this. These are some links that you have. So what are my pearls that I picked up from last decade of kind of training uh, interventional fellows and residents and st students? Surgical internship is, in, is very impactful. Uh, ideally integrated same program, but vascular surgery, IR, ICU, surgical are all powerful rotations. Transplant surgery, trauma are all very valuable things, hepatobiliary, et cetera. ICU and clinic are impactful, all right? So uh, the clinic is, in, is so important, all right? Um, the hack-to-back -back months of interventional during the first three years are very helpful in those gap years. And then we started a clinical lecture series that we do about four hours of dedicated clinic for, or clinical lecture series for our residents. Um, that's been pretty helpful for them to learn a lot of these concepts throughout their diagnostic years and the, you know, the, throughout residency training. So diagnostics is very important because you learn anatomy and pathology from head to toe, all right? But clinic is the first six letters of clinician and you need to get that down. It's critical for sustainable success. And really, quite frankly, the most important part of medicine is being a guidance counselor to your patients. So we got to transform plumbers to this, where we're sitting there, you know, with our face masks on, socially distanced now, or on Zoom or, you know, with, with our patients and talking to them and guiding them about their disease. So it is our own responsibility to learn this disease. So currently many are great technicians, but poor clinicians. We have to be able to successfully compete and give them the proper tools to compete with our clinical colleagues and really take care of patients in a conference of longitudinal fashion. It must be the norm. So our residents do a lot of clinic because um, it, uh, every other discipline does. And again, this is where you learn to be a doctor. The patients are gonna ask you tough questions that you, if you don't know the answer to, you look up or you ask someone else, but that's how you're gonna figure out the natural history disease, all right? And that is where we need to spend the time. This is one of my uh, PGY4s, Karthik, who, or a few years ago, 2018, or three years ago, almost three years ago now, when we established the, the resident clinic uh, for them, you could see he had a spattering of women's health, men's health, interventional oncology, aortic disease, PAD, it's uh, venous disease, uh, oncology, et cetera, kind of a mix and a lot of follow-ups, a varying range, some new consults. And um, I think uh, that was impactful. And then finally, once we get them graduated, we got to get them jobs where they can do the right thing and see patients. So that's what we're also working on to make sure that they know that all the different options, you know? Um, so this is a patient that, you know, uh, had a surgery in the 1990s with this uh, Corvita graft, 2000, this is a final uh, case. Um, and this is a Corvita graft. Unfortunately, he, uh, we admitted him because he had a, a moderate effusion. Um, and he had disruption. For this graft, you had to really drop the pressure. So my uh, integrated resident, uh, Harut, uh, had nitro ready, clavidipine ready, and levo in the room so we could drop the pressure. The pressure dropped so we could deploy the graft. 
Um, and then the pressure dropped too much, so we had to start the levo. So we had clevuprex and nitro, we adjusted those meds. So it's very important to know your pharmacologic adjuncts, vasodilators, vasopressors, when you're doing any of this work, including bleeding or any of this, it's invaluable, all right? So, so I treated him about two years ago, um, March of 2019. Unfortunately, he came back and this, this graph and it is a, is a is another graph that just got recently some issues with type three endoleaks. And in fact, this one year follow looked great, but poor guy had some uh, flank pain um, and he had an endoleak and we had to do another repair just on Monday with some new uh, reline the graph and we were able to kind of control his pain immediately. And again, we just were able to do this with local and sedation percutaneously with a, you know, a half a milligram of Versed and, uh, or, or, uh, and midazolam and 50 micrograms of, of fentanyl. So um, this is my colleague, Dr. Botten, my integrated resident on one of my patients. So they're doing a pedal access, reconstructing it, and they got the flow, but they also debrided kind of the infection. And as this is our integrated residents, they did a lot of wound care, kind of debriding the wound to get it to heal with a nice kind of base. So I think we're creating the brightest and best. Um, surgical types desire to take care of patients. We need true clinical integration. ICU is very high yield. Clinics are a must during your radiology years, PGY2 through, or if from after med school, you need to have clinic. Integrate it weekly and learn to find a job afterwards. Here's my email. Here's the RFS website. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'll open up to, I know there's been a lot in the chat, but I'll open up to any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Georgie. And uh, this was awesome. This was, uh, a lot educative um, and we had a lot of flow of questions and inputs from I think the Kaiser colleagues. Thank you so much. So we will welcome a few questions and uh, and we wind up later. Great, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Oh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you. Are there any, Ivan, are there any questions you have or anyone or you, anyone else has that uh, I'm, I'm happy well, to answer? Uh, Lam and... They got uh, it all done. Yeah, oh, they, they got all the questions fight, like answered like... Perfect. The chat, the chat is almost full. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Lam. And, we shared quite, and a number of, uh, quite a number of links that I would encourage the trainees who are the chat to try and take and pass through them. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for this opportunity. I hope we can do more uh, collaborative efforts, you know. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you, everyone who managed to tune in. Uh, let, we are looking forward for our next uh, grand rounds next week on Thursday. We'll keep the communications alive. Thank you so much, all. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining in. Hope we can collaborate together, continue to do this. Oh, yeah. Sure, we will. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you.